it's the summer of 2017. I see auditions for Rock of Ages. So it's a musical, but in this musical, I, and I looked it up because I'd never seen it, but I, I knew that it was a bunch of great songs from the 80s that I loved. Uh, so I knew it was going to be a lot of fun, and I started looking into it. I, I never saw the movie either, but uh, it turns out the band is featured on stage. So I, I looked into the musical because I had started acting at this point. I'd been in um, Jesus Christ Superstar, a couple of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan operettas, and Bonnie and Clyde, the musical. So I had started my acting uh, and loving it, but you know, I also love the drums. And so again, you know, like Frog and Toad, I'm mixing uh, like jazz, pop, and orchestral music. In this one, I'm mixing uh, drums and acting. So the drummer will be on stage. Uh, I, I looked into all the roles and, you know, there's nothing for a bass. I'm a bass vocalist. So, uh, and I thought it'd be more fun to play the drums anyway. So I played Frog and Toad and then also subbed for the Adams Family Musical. And those were from the same uh, musical theater group as this one. So, um, I had an in with the the drummer, you know, I, I know their, their primary drummer, you know, I, I formed a relationship with him and I knew he would have first dibs at the drumming chair for, for this, but I, I, I called him up and said, hey, you know, are, are you going to play Rock of Ages? And he wasn't into it, so I'm like, cool, and so I, I'm all over it. But I, I didn't know, I, I looked up who the music director was and I didn't know who he was. So I figured uh, the best way to introduce myself would be to go down and audition for cast. Because I know that the music director is always there for auditions. So I um, learned on guitar and vocals um, Patience from Guns N' Roses. And, you know, I. I'm not really a guitar player, but you know, you're just strumming chords, so I can do that. Um, and so I went there and I did the audition and I just sang Patience and took the opportunity to introduce myself to the music director and I, I told him, you know, uh, I, flat out, I, I didn't think there was really a place for me in the cast, but I want to play drums. And uh, so, you know, I showed him that I was musical, because I, I knew he was a guitarist, so I showed him I was musical, showed him I was into it, and um, uh, the normal drummer vouched for me, and so uh, it worked, and I totally got it. So I was thrilled. Okay, so I got the gig, and I'm really excited. Uh, you know, I'm gonna play all these songs that I grew up with and I totally love. So I started thinking about equipment. Uh, I hadn't gotten the music yet, but I'm starting to think of these songs. You know, I looked up on YouTube all the songs and I'm starting to think of what I need. And, you know, it's common for 80s bands like this to play two bass drums, you know, double bass drums. Um, and I only have one. So I had a pretty nice large kit, but only one bass drum. So I had a double bass drum pedal, so I knew I could use that, but you know, I kind of wanted two bass drums, but, you know, what are you going to do? So, uh, I did finally, um, you know, after talking to the music director, I did get the drum book. And so I started looking through it and seeing what's written. And um, I found out I only needed the three rack toms, a floor tom, and it did actually have some double bass drum stuff in there. Um, and then there was a tambourine. So... You know, when I did Frog and Toad, I, I came up with the idea of um, each show I'll buy something little, you know, little percussion thing. So that time it was a triangle and this time I bought a tambourine. Uh, you know, it didn't cost too much and it's something I should have and something that I could use not only in this show, other shows, um, but also like in other bands that I play in. So I thought it was a good investment. I went out and got a cool one that kind of like sits on a stand and I can hit it with a stick while I'm playing. 
but I can also take it off and shake it like a tambourine. So I'm looking through the, the book and I'm getting really excited. You know, the, the, the drum book was actually written very well. Uh, a lot of drum books are just like written like crap, but this one, I could tell whoever did it, uh, did actually listen to the original songs and the original drummers. You know, it wasn't totally right, but it was very close. Um, so I'm getting really excited, you know. I started thinking, you know, this is may be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I don't know if I'll ever play this show again. I hope to, but at the time I didn't know. This might be my only chance, and so I'm thinking, man, I need. I'm gonna look for another bass drum. <laughs> They're expensive. I, I mean, I started looking uh, at regular stores and, you know, they, first of all, they don't really sell just bass drums and they're too expensive. And then I started looking at Craigslist and lo and behold, uh, I found this beautiful, you know, similar color to mine. Wasn't exact, but close enough. Same brand. Um, and I called the guy up, you know, it, it was dirt cheap. I couldn't freaking believe how cheap it was. And it came with a bunch of cymbals, a bunch of hardware, and, and I mean, everything, all this stuff. I'm like, oh my God, you know. So I, I go to this guy's house and I check it out and it's totally awesome, rad. I'll say it's totally rad. <laughs> and uh, I'm just like, okay, and I buy it. So. And I, I justified it in that, um, you know, I, I also wanted to start playing in bands again. So I thought, well, you know, most drummers have a practice set that they leave at home or in a studio, whatever, that they use just for practicing. And then they have the gigging set. So it's high time that I have two drum sets. <laughs> so what the heck? I, I go out and I get it. It was so cheap. I mean, I... I'd basically be an idiot if I didn't do this. Um, so no regrets at all. Alright, so now I've got my full double bass drum set up that I've always wanted. I mean, let's face it, you know, if you're a drummer, growing up as a kid, I've always wanted this. You know, I did have a seven-piece drum set, which is really nice. I love it, no, you know. Um, but... I never had a double, actual, real two bass drum drum set. And I'm thinking, you know, if not now, then when? And so I, I just did it. And I spent all this time in the garage putting it all together. And it was so much fun to, you know, just to set it all up. So I'm like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this legit. But then it occurred to me, oh, wait a minute. I'm assuming I'm going to have enough space on stage. So I, um, I start communicating with all, all the production staff and the designers and the set designer. Uh, music director, I'm like, hey, you know, how much space am I going to have? <laughs> I'm thinking about putting together a massive drum set. And, you know, I, I, I built the case that, you know, the, I'm going to be on stage and these drums are a prop, essentially. This gives legitimacy to, you know, the whole thing. I'm supposed to be, the, the show is set in the 80s, so it's not like we're just playing 80s song. It's, it's in L.A. in the 80s. And so if you don't do this, in my opinion, it's not right. So uh, I convinced them of that. And uh, they gave me a lot more space than they were originally planning. So I'm, I'm glad I got to them. Uh, when I did <laughs> and it totally worked out so they ended up building this riser for me uh, I mean I mean it's just like it, it was it was so awesome it's like you know what you dream about doing is just playing this massive drum set on a riser in, in an 80s rock band so we were kind of pushed back in the stage I mean that's the thing so this is a rock musical it's not a rock show. Uh, we were not the focus of the show. We were on stage and we were part of it, you know, but there were singers and da dancers and actors and there was a story and all sorts of stuff going on. So, yeah, we're a part of it, but no, we weren't the main focus. Still, um, you know, it, it had to be awesome. And so in my mind, this was my biggest prop. 
and you know always on stage and it's basically it has to be this way another thing that I had to consider was you know I had this massive drum set um, this is an outdoor show and afterwards what do I do with the drums do I have to pack them up and bring them home every night uh, I'm just like god I hope not uh, so I talked to the staff and fortunately they had a little room right off the stage. It's like a little shed, like tool shed basically. Um, but carpeted and air conditioned and everything. So, you know, they thought of everything. Um, so I'm so grateful. They actually gave me two uh, nice young ladies to help me uh, tear down and set up. Uh, for each rehearsal and for each performance and so oh my gosh without those two I mean it would have been brutal so thank you thank you <laughs> so the next thing I started looking at you know I've got my equipment everything is awesome um, I start thinking about okay so you know typically in a musical theater production you you sit there and you read your music you've got a music stand and you play along to it but I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to be on stage. No bands, you know, Poison, uh, Twisted Sister, all those bands, they don't use music stands and read through books. So I'm just like, you know, that's, I, I, I'm, I don't want to look lame. I don't want to do that. And, and plus, there's no room. <laughs> uh, so I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to memorize this thing. And... You know, I knew most of the songs anyway. Uh, the one challenge, though, is they don't play the songs straight through. So they do these medleys, but on top of that, they they don't just like go a little bit of a song, a little bit of a song, a little bit of a song. They they like go, they weave in and out of songs. So that part was very challenging. You know, if if I were just playing the song straight through, it would have been so easy, but so I had to get a feel for that, all the weaving. So that was just basically studying. Anyway, so that was the big challenge. So you're not playing the song straight through. You, you're, you're getting little bits and then there's dialogue in between. So you're playing like this background music and stuff. And so I did end up leaving the book on the stage and I did have a music stand, but it was way off to the side. And I made sure that it wasn't even visible from from the from the audience and I, I put it there just for reference to make sure I didn't get lost um, to help me out with little little bits that I just couldn't memorize but for the like the rocking parts I'm just like I'm just going for it you know and because the drum part was written very close to uh, the album uh, I just I just listened to the albums. I listened to the drummer, and I played I played what the drummer played. I didn't even bother with the book, um, and uh, you know that gave it some authentic authenticity, and it was more fun. You know, just doing like a normal drummer would do if I'm playing in Twisted Sister. Like if if they called me and said, "Hey, man, we need you to play Twisted Sister," that that's kind of the approach I was taking. So. Uh, yeah, so I'm just, I'm, when we're playing like you're not going to take it, I'm just, I'm playing like, I'm playing like, I'm pretending like I'm Twisted Sister. I'm not like reading a book, doing this musical theater thing. I'm, I'm going for it. I'm playing loud. So uh, that brings me to another topic. So, you know, in the Frog and Toad thing, I'm playing really quietly and, and I'm like, finally, in this show, it's going to be outside. It's a full on rock extravaganza. I'm going to play full volume you know like twisted sister or poison would have done so i'm doing that and i i had to get my stamina up uh in order to do that so but all the rehearsals like the dress rehearsals when we're on the stage and in the amphitheater i'm going full out and um it turned out i was too powerful <laughs> So even though it's an outdoor, you know, 800 seat amphitheater, I guess the drums were still bleeding through all the mics of all the actors. And so um, they ended up putting a plexiglass shield up 
and told me to cut back. <laughs> so I'm playing like half volume. So still pretty loud, but I just want to be on the record, you know, that I was originally playing louder. Um, but I had to scale it back for the sake of the show. Again, you know, this isn't a rock show. This is a rock musical. And, uh, you know, the, the vocals and the dialogue, that's the most important thing. So it was disappointing, but, um, you know, I had to, had to accommodate the show. Uh, so again, we go to rehearsals like any other musical theater uh, gig. We just went into some little rehearsal space and we were playing all these really loud, heavy rock songs really quietly because, you know, it, <laughs> we were in this little tiny spot. Uh, and same thing, we only had two or three rehearsals. Um, you know, we had to write notes on the, the, the book. Um, the music director would say, okay, you know, this is the tempo here, this is the vocal cue. So, you know, it was a musical theater thing. So we had all of the elements of musical theater. We had vamps, you know, we had cues to, to watch for, all sorts of that stuff that you normally get. In addition to, you know, playing r loud rock music on stage. So, um, you know, it's a little bit, there's more, there's more challenge because, you know, when you're on stage, you, you have to, you're performing. And so you have to, you know, you're acting in a way. Uh, I mean, not always, if, 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 if you're really into the music, it's going to show you're really into it, but you have to also be aware that, you know, you're part of a theatrical production. So we had wigs and we had makeup and they did wardrobe and, uh, I had props, you know, these bands, and I had, you know, a vodka bottle and fake cigarette and fake lighter, and, you know, we were on the stage, we were part of the production. So after the few rehearsals that we had, um, we did do a sits probe, which is where the band gets together with the cast, and we just play the music, and they just do the singing. So they don't do any choreography, they don't do any of the acting, it's just music and vocals, so we can kind of sync up on that. And in this case, it was a lot of fun because it's, you know, it's basically like karaoke night, 80s rock band. <laughs> and it was fun. It was, you know, when you're in rehearsals with just the band, you're just playing the music. But when you hear the vocals, it, you know, it just, everybody got more excited. And, you know, it was a, a nice gathering. You know, I knew a lot of the actors, so I'm hanging out with them and, uh, you know, it was great. It was a great time. Really cool Six Pro. So I'm so thrilled. Everything is totally killer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking through the book and uh, I, I noticed the introduction of, of the whole musical is just, it's balls out rock and roll. You know, the band is shining at the opening of the of the of the whole thing so it's basically a drum solo um, you know the whole band is playing but it's featured the drums at the beginning so I look at what's written and um, you know it's pretty good but it's uh, not as good as I wanted it to be I mean I'm, I'm, I'm going for it right so you know I, I, I ask the music director I say hey you mind if I embellish the uh, introduction a little bit he's like no, no, not at all. It looks kind of generic. Go for it. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> so I actually spent some time. I, I built the drums in my uh, bathroom here. And that's where I was practicing at home. You know, because I actually use my garage to park my car. <laughs> so I moved it all up into the bathroom. Uh, I, you know, left enough space to do what I needed to do. But so this way I could practice at home and that was key, you know, to, to getting my um, uh, stamina back and being, being able to play nice and loud. And, but also it gave me the chance to sit and come up with this drum solo introduction and practice it and make sure I could reliably do it well uh, every night. Okay, I'm thinking I need to prepare something. So I'm going to have an outline. I, I usually... I don't play anything exactly the same every time, but I do have a general outline of what I'm going to do. So that way I'm not, I'm not just winging it because then it's just, you run the risk of making mistakes and 
This is the opening of the show. It's got to be larger than life. Okay, so here's what I came up with. And I wrote it all out uh, just now. I, I never actually wrote it out uh, before the performance. I did it just for this video. And uh, it's in three sections. So it's basically um, David Lee Roth, Paradise in the beginning. It's like the intro of Paradise, but it's heavier. And more drums, like the album version doesn't have a big drum solo, but this version, uh, it is a big drum solo. And then after the drum intro, we have a guitar solo, which is actually in the album. Uh, it's like the, the melody. And then there's some blistering guitar stuff going on. And that's why the drums is so sparse here, because it's not, you know, you don't want to compete with the guitarist. So it's his turn to shine, it's your turn to lay back. And then the third section is Come On, Feel The Noise. And this is what the whole weaving thing that I was talking about. So it starts off with Paradise, then goes into Come On, Feel The Noise. And then I stopped it here because that's kind of where the interesting drum stuff stops. But in the actual show, you're going back into paradise there. So you're like going in and out. And then even after that, you end up into uh, nothing but a good time from Poison, all in like one song. <laughs> so that's the part, you know, that's what I was talking about. It's kind of, that was the challenging part for me. You know, like knowing these songs, you know, just cutting them up like that and then trying to remember where those cuts were. Okay, so let's get into this. So um, I've got on the top the original score and on the bottom staff the uh, my, you know, what I did, my enhancement is what I call it. Um, so one thing about the notation, like... The way I, I wrote out the way that they notated it, I copied this from the uh, the the main score, not the actual drum book. I'm I'm hoping it's the same, but I you know when I did this, I didn't actually uh, get an electric copy of the drum book, so I don't have it. But I was able to get the score, and so I I just copied it as it was written on the score, and you'll notice the way that they did it. It's kind of harder to read in my opinion, like they do anything below the G will have the uh, stems down, anything above the G will have the stems up. It's like you're reading two different parts, you know, so that's not usually how I notate. So the way that I notate, I'll put stems down like for the kick usually if, if I'm not thinking about the kick, you know, the kick is kind of like its own in its own world. I'll treat it as such and then what's happening with my hands is written like separately because I'm thinking of it that way. But then when they come together like in a beat, you know, I write them together because I'm thinking of them together. So that's how I notate it and I get it like the way they did it this way is easier with the software. You know, notation software is really difficult to work with. So I understand that but I'm just explaining the, the difference in notation. In the drum score, there are three rock toms and a floor tom. Uh, so I, I did set up that configuration at home also, and it is kind of cool, but I had more drums and I'm thinking, you know, why not? The name of the band on stage is Arsenal, so <laughs> I'm going to bring my full bombardment of drums. So I ended up with five rock toms, floor, do uh, floor tom, snare drum, bass drum. Uh, two bass drums. Uh, so that aside, I guess um, let's get into it. So we'll start with the the beginning is kind of like pretty laid back. Um, and my embellishment is I, I took this rhythm, this rhythmic change is uh, like the, the guy from the Broadway version did it this way. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, that's way better than what's written. So I kept that kind of theme just for the first two bars, I guess just the first bar. And then the rest, I, I try to keep, you know, the, the you know, like, like I said, kind of the theme going. I just, I did it my way, you know, like 
I don't see a need to keep time with my hi-hat on my left foot. You know, I'm going to use my left foot for, you know, cool bass drum stuff like you'll see here. You know, this is what I'm doing with my left foot. I'm not doing this. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that's like jazz. Jazz players do that. Rock drummers don't do that, at least in my opinion. Uh, and that's the other thing, like in the score, I, I do remember in the drum book, it like, it said click track. So it, it told you like the beats per minute and where to start your click. And, uh, you know, we didn't use a click for our, our production. It, it did come up and the music director uh, said, no, nope, we're not doing a click. So, uh, you know, looking back at it, yeah, I'm, I'm fine either way. I, I played a click. I don't play the click. I don't really care. Um, but I am proud if you listen to the, uh, the recordings. I, I do a pretty good job of keeping a steady beat. All right, so that's basically the gist of the story. I, I try to keep, like, the, the main rhythm is dun, 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 dun. So I, I do that. I'm just adding drums. And here I add a little bit of flair. Uh, alternate sticking on the snare drum and the china cymbals and you can see that in the video it's just it's one of those things where if you're just listening to the music you can't tell but you know if you're watching the performance it just adds some you know visual coolness so you know I, I wrote that in the notation just so it's not lost and I also do two cymbals you know that's just what I chose to write but so I'm using all my toms, uh, you know, it's the same sort of beat. It's just, that is, that's like a 70s style drum fill. And I, I put more of an 80s style thing, you know, personal choice, personal preference. They're basically the same here. I'm just adding some more notes, um, going through all of my toms, but it's basically the same thing. Now here's where it, it kind of gets cool. So in the original, um, he's basically doing the same thing here. So that's where it's a little bit dull. Whereas I, I bring on the onslaught, you know, <laughs> bring on the, the thunderous floor tom and bass drum. And here's where I, I'm thinking of the floor tom and the bass drum as its own thing and these higher toms as its own thing. So that's how I think of it in my head. And so that's how I notated it. And then we come together here at, at the, on the fourth beat. So the thing about this, like the reason I chose to do that, and I came with, up with this kind of later in the development of this solo, you know, when I was on stage, I heard the booming, like they had a great sound system. So I didn't know what to expect, but their sound system was really, really good. And so the low notes sounded really booming and, and thunderous. So that's why I decided to feature it. So um, when you hear this, like in an arena with a great sound system, it's just it's so cool. It's just this rolling, thunderous, low, uh, I don't know, onslaught of coolness. <laughs> and then, uh, again, another visual thing. I'm hitting these just one, these one little notes, but with my left hand, you know, and the right hand and the bass drum are doing this. And so when you look at it, you hear a ton of stuff going on, but you, you don't see a ton of stuff going on you see just the one stick. And so it's kind of like, it also makes it seem like magic, you know? And so that's just kind of, it, it's just cool. It just adds to the like allure, you know? So I always forget something and I forgot about this. This is, I, I really like this. So this is a, um, this is actually written correctly and this is how I think of it when I play it. So you'll notice like, usually like, here, the floor tom and the one of the rack toms, they they play in unison in this uh, this pattern that I have riff or whatever you want to call it. They play in unison later, but when they start out, I do a. It's not really a flam. It's more of a grace note, 
and the the floor tom is on the downbeat of the note so it's like a i don't know exactly how you describe that but it's the the snare drum is not on the actual beat the floor tom is so um that's why like in the recording it, it this first uh group of six sounds a little bit different than the rest and that's why and you know frankly I, I didn't play it all that great but that's the other thing so when you're if you're listening to this on your phone like you can hear that it's not exactly right but if it's like over a really booming stereo system it just sounds like freaking cool thunder man <laughs> you know? so you're not really hearing all the notes you're just hearing you know and it's just Oh my goodness, it's just, I mean, this is what 80s hair metal is all about, or, you know, I, you know, so that's why I put it in there, and, and I left it, like, the, the take that I, I did, I just left it, because it's, uh, it's rock and roll, it's not meant to be perfect. That's my excuse. And then here we start over again uh, with the, the opening beat and the same uh, sticking china thing and then here I switch the fill a little bit keeping pretty much the same rhythm I guess I'm offsetting the triplets but it's still like bah, dum, bah, dum, bah. and this is the same it's dun 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 I'm just doing it slightly differently um, and then same thing here I do the same sort of tom thing as I did earlier just because that's like a crowd pleaser, you know, everybody sees your arms flailing and going fast. It's one of those things like, you know, for drummers, it's not necessarily all that interesting, but for the crowd, I think they, they like that. And then here, it's actually, I uh, keep pretty much what's written because I liked it. Uh, but I added the Chinas and the right, left, right, left China. So this is another visual thing where... It just looks like you're you're going crazy with the cymbals and the snare drums and it it looks busier than it's written and so uh, it's another one of those things it's visual i am on stage this is not just a recording so the audience sees all this stuff and you know this is the beginning of the show so you're making a first impression <laughs> you know so if you nail this uh you know, you can make mistakes later on in the show and nobody's going to care. But, if, you know, if you your first impression is killer, then that's a big deal. So uh, here's the same thing. Round Robin with all the toms. And then, you know, because I had so many toms, I had to squeeze them all in here at the end. And, it you know, it sounded cool. It's just like a great, like, boom. And... um you know, I, I played it really as hard as I could. I didn't like, you know, a lot of times it's it's easier to play these fast notes softer, but I, I, I made a conscious effort every time not to do that. Every Tom hit, I gave it my all. And so that was another visual thing. It When you're hitting them hard, it makes it look like a more of a struggle, you know, and that's what rock and roll is all about. It's a struggle. Okay, so down here, um, well, I guess I'll keep talking. Now let's go, let's, let's play the track. And we'll just follow along here. This is, 
Uh, I thought, you know, when I came up with this, this is, I wrote it exactly how I think of it when I play it. And I was thinking, well, is there a simpler way to write this? But I don't think that there is, because if you, if you do the math, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, six times three is 18 beats. 18 notes divided over four beats. So I don't think there's a, an easier way to write this. But it's basically, if you look at what was written in the score, which is pretty simple, I'm just taking that and throwing in triplet kick drums in between each note and then adding a flam because, you know, rock drummers uh, do flams. <laughs> So that's that's basically it, and then this is how it's written. Uh, so and that's exactly how I think of it. I, I think of it as dun 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 dun, and then I'm just throwing in the kick drums in there. So that's that, and then this part here, you'll notice um, in the score, it's like dun dun dun. They they put the kick drum in in this like crescendo thing, and I purposefully left mine out. Oh, and you'll notice my kick drum is on the, the D and theirs is on the F. That's just because I have more drums. So that's another difference in the notation. But so I'm just doing the floor tom and one of the rack toms. And then the, the snare drum I, I throw in there to accentuate that beat because um, the lead guitarist would actually end his solo there and kind of like flung his guitar on that note so it was another really cool visual thing that we did but the reason i left my kick drum out and that was intentional is because when i come in here i want that kick drum to make an impact and again you know when you're in a big theater with a massive killer booming bass sound system that kick drum really stands out and so if i'm wasting it here um, it, it just, it doesn't have the same impact. So that was intentional. And, uh, you know, it's all this stuff I, I just think about. And then here, it's just cool. It's just a visual thing. I'm going around the toms, each one by one, and then more thunder, you know, reminiscent of, uh, reminiscent of this, uh, similar you know similar speed I think these are actually probably faster if you do the math which I haven't <laughs> but it's very similar it's very close together uh, so that's basically it let's do it one more time the same every night but you know sometimes I would just I would feel like just doing something else and I would do something else but for the most part it was the same okay so we've done our rehearsals we've done our sits probe uh, you know it's time to move into the theater the stage was built you know they're still adding stuff as we're going in fact uh, these big Marshall stacks here uh, you know, it's it's fake. It's just plywood made to look like Marshall stacks. There were was no on stage um, amplifiers. You know, we used our in ear monitors um, 
and that's just because otherwise it would have all that stuff would have bled into the microphones of the actors and the the sound designers uh, would have you know it would have been impossible it was hard enough for them you know like I said with the drums you know they put up this plexiglass <laughs> in fact these um, these are like beams that they had to put in because originally they just laid the plexiglass there and a big back wind came and it fell on the keyboardist's head. So they learned that lesson the hard way and they so they, they put these big poles up and kind of wedged the glass in there. So you know these are things you just you kind of learn as you're going. They had never done it. I'd never played behind one before and uh, poor Catherine. I'm sure had never had one land on her head before, <laughs> but she was fine. I'm laughing, you know, because nobody got hurt. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I heard the story uh, that the original Broadway um, version of this show, you know, they also couldn't deal with the stage volume of the drums. <clears throat> so apparently there, there's just like this big box, like enclosure on the stage and <laughs> they put the drums in this enclosure and it wasn't like plexiglass or anything it's just like a big black box and the drummer was in there and uh you know they they made fun of it like in the show they like a sign on the and this is what i've heard i, I don't know but there's like a sign on the door that says don't feed the drummer or some you know some stupid thing like that in fact i don't know if the drummer was actually in there or maybe he's backstage I, I don't know what the case is but they had the same issue with the stage volume and the drums. So thankfully they didn't do that uh, <laughs> for me. Because, I mean, what fun is that? I love being on stage. I, that, to me, that's a big part of it. I just love being on stage. So very grateful they didn't put me... I mean, I didn't like being behind the plexiglass, but it was a nice compromise. <laughs> a nice middle ground between being totally open and versus being in a freaking box. <laughs> uh, and, and electric drums, like I said earlier, I mean, that would have helped with the stage volume, but uh, I didn't have any electric drums. I'm not going to spend that much money and then learn how to use them. You know, that, and they weren't even really on my radar. It never even came up, frankly. And uh, nobody in the staff even mentioned it. It never once came up to use electric drums for this show. Um, thinking about it now, of course, I do have uh, electric drums that actually look like drums. Uh, so I could pull it off now. Um, so maybe I'll have the opportunity in the future. And I, I probably uh, at least would consider it. Um, so that's the thing. So electric drums nowadays... They actually look really good and they can sound fantastic. Um, so that would be an option for if I were to play this show in the future. Just an option, you know, I'll keep all my options open. I, I mean, I love playing the acoustic drums too. I mean, <laughs> it's freaking awesome. And nothing's ever quite like that, but I would do the electric drums too if I had to. But yeah, so our, our stage looked awesome. You know, it's totally cool. Um, and we're doing our sound checks. We have our in-ear monitors. So they're basically like earbuds. And in my case, I've got little foam. So they're like a combination of earplugs and uh, earbuds. So it blocks out all the other sound. And so all I'm hearing is what the, uh, the sound technicians are, are giving to me. And, you know, it's like I've said in some of my other videos for like my sound check video. Same thing here. So I'd have to tell the sound guy, hey, I need more guitar, I can't hear the guitar. Or I need to hear the, uh, the actors, you know, because we have cues, vocal cues or lines, like, you know, uh, you know, like, I want to rock, Dun, that was the cue. It's like nobody's counting us off. I'm listening for the actor to just scream, I want to rock, and then we hit it. Uh, and then another one, you know, too much time on my hand, same thing. The guy goes, say you don't know me. You know, so if I can't hear that, <laughs> it doesn't work. 
So, you know, we had to make sure that I could hear, and all of us, not, not just me, obviously, we all have to hear. So we spent a lot of time dialing all that stuff in. And another issue I did have, so sometimes the music director would cue me um, because I couldn't see like the whole stage. You know, these Marshall stacks are blocking my line of sight. So sometimes on stage left, uh, there'd be all sorts of action going on and I'm supposed to like do the wind chimes or something and I can't see what they're doing. I have no idea. So we didn't have a visual monitor. That would have been helpful, but we didn't have that. So I would take a cue from the music director, the guitarist. He would like go like this and I would do the chimes. But sometimes he was, you know, I couldn't even see him because he'd be like in front of these amplifiers. And so <laughs> I'd ask Catherine or Ed, you know, Ed, the other guitarist, to keep, give me certain cues. So if you watch the video, um, you know, the link to the video right here. If you watch the main video for like uh, Don't Stop Believing at the very end, uh, Ed and Tim, the guitarists, they go center stage way up front. And so it's just like, you know, me and Catherine and the, you know, the bass player over here, Alex, uh, I, I couldn't see him at all for throughout the entire show. <laughs> So I've got Catherine here and she would give me cues like sometimes because I, I couldn't, you know, Ed and Tim are stage, you know, center stage way up front. I couldn't see them at all. I had no idea if, you know, what was going on. I could hear them, um, but, you know, I, I could only hear the guitar. I can't hear if, if they're screaming and yelling. They don't have microphones, so I can't hear them. So I couldn't possibly get cues from either of them. So sometimes Catherine's giving me cues like one, two. Yeah, there's one time where uh, Adam, the uh, the uh, the star of the show, the star male lead, um, he goes one, two, three, four, and so a lot of times. Uh, I couldn't hear him because there's a lot going on. There's all sorts of chaos. And so Catherine, you'll see in the video, she actually gives me one, two, three, four. That time I do remember I did hear it, but it was nice to have that visual <laughs> because without that, you know, the drums come in and it's supposed to go like ba 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 ba. And if the drums don't come in, I mean it just doesn't work. So there were quite a few of those actually. Uh the one with um Hit me with your best shot. Uh, it, that was like very challenging. So it's the same thing. I could not see the actor. There was a timing issue where the actor, uh, some of the other actors like strip off some of his clothing to reveal like a jumpsuit or something. And I, you know, I just, I heard about this. I've never seen it. I mean, I've since seen the show, but I had no idea what the hell was going on. So uh, that was really challenging because it, there was a lot of timing that had to go just right because it was supposed to be funny. So comedic timing is so key. So there is a comedic timing thing linked with the music, linked with the vocals, and man, that was tough. But uh, so we all worked together to, to give me the cues because I'm just, I'm giving like the four count, like or the fourth beat, Blah, hit me with your best shot. So I need to do that at the right time. And man, uh, we, we rehearsed that a lot and uh, finally got it. And if, if you watch the video, I mean, it's it, freaking great. And every night that number got such a massive uh, round of applause. I mean, everybody loved it. Just it, it totally worked well, you know, they, the way they did it on stage was hilarious. Uh, you know, it's a great song. I mean, everything about it was just fantastic. Now, another thing I noticed that would happen is, um, so <clears throat> it wasn't just a challenge for the band to hear the vocalists, but the vocalists would need to hear the band too. And so, um, 
you know, they're just people on stage walking around. They actually did not have in-ear monitors. So I think they had stage monitors. I'm not exactly sure. But there are some quiet passages where it's just, you know, like rhythm guitar and, and vocals, like some really tender, like more than words, I remember. And, you know, Allie, the, um, the lead female uh, in this show, you know, great singer, very sweet voice. And she was that specific song. I remember the guitar is kind of like there's syncopation. It's down, 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 down. You know, it's like a lot of upstrokes. And she is trying to, like the, the original extreme version, it's very rhythmic. You know, the vocalist uh, stays to the rhythm. But she's trying to kind of give it more emotion, you know, to, to be in the character. And so she would, you know, flow more. And I could tell that um, it, it, they needed help keeping the beat. And so I, I just tapped on the hi-hat. I would just, you know, keep it together. It wasn't written in the book. It's not on the album. Although I think the guitarist, like hits the guitar with his pick to kind of do that. But, uh, and there's a few other items like that. And, and you got to understand, you know, the, the actors, they're getting very emotional on with some of these songs. And so they're trying to portray like two people falling in love. And so they've got to make that believable. And so they're not like counting, you know, they're not, um, I mean, it, it's it's challenging, and so I understand that, you know. Um, and so I would just help them out. I would just keep time, and um, you know, it's part of the drummer's job. So that's again, you know, with the musical theater and just being a drummer. You know, I, I played in real bands, so I, I know all this stuff happens. I've been an actor on stage, and I know how it can be. Like, and sometimes you you've got lights in your face, and you can't see anything, and uh, you know, so I try to, to help out and, and make it easier for everybody. And, uh, you know, it doesn't take back, it doesn't take away anything for the song. You know, it's just kind of, it's part of the part of the song. And it, I think it worked out fine and everything kept together. All right, so I mentioned before, you know, this isn't a rock show. This is a musical. You know, we're on stage and we're a big part of it, but we're not the main focus. However, I did also mention there's a big rock drum solo at the beginning. And after the drum solo comes like a ripping guitar solo. So it's our time to shine. Uh, and then at the end too. So we've got the beginning and we've got the end where it's just totally devoted to the band. So when it's our time to shine, we rose to the occasion and I, you know, my drum solo, I, again, I'm not reading a book or anything. I'm just, I'm just nailing it. And, and I was going full volume because there's no vocalists on stage, nothing to worry about. So I'm just, I'm playing, I'm playing as hard as I can. And then the other time to shine was at the end. So the bows, you know, it's like the show's over, but now everybody comes out to, you know, bow and everybody's applauding and you know, everybody had a great time and everybody's excited and we're just jamming on don't stop believing and you know there was something written in the book i'm just like man <laughs> i'm just i played whatever the hell i wanted to so i at the end and the guitars too they're just it's a solo it was a, basically a, like a five minute guitar solo and I'm, I'm keeping the beat you know because while they're doing the bows i'm not trying to Put attention on myself it needs to be lively and so i did i played it faster than that song normally goes and um, so i'm keeping it lively and everybody's getting you know doing their bows and the guitarist is soloing then when everybody's off stage and they're done with their bows that's when again i started shining i i do some like double bass drum stuff and a lot of china cymbals and you know, I, I made sure I had a china on both sides because it's like one of my favorite things to like do this, you know, just visually, it, I don't know, I like it. So I just go like, 
So I'm doing all that stuff and I'm playing it hard and, you know, off to the side here, be backstage, uh, you know, the cast is just, because they're done with their bows and they're just back there just cheering it. You know, at that point, it felt like a real rock show. Like all my fans, you know, all my groupies were down here and they're just totally, you know, they're blowing off steam. They just got through this very challenging show and it's awesome. So everybody's just like so thrilled and I'm just playing my heart out and ah, uh, so yeah, the end of the show is just so exhilarating. Oh my God, great show. I love it. I'd do it all over again if I could and hopefully I will. <laughs>